Bruchim uh, Aboim. Thank you for coming. We are, last week we finished up a uh, lecture with jealousy. And uh, <laughs> with it being the kind of topic it is, we weren't able to finish all of it in that one session. So let's continue. Um, you know, they tell a story of a uh, businessman who, a competitor, moved into town and he uh, went to see his rabbi. And he said to the rabbi, he wanted the rabbi to pray for uh, that this man would uh, not be successful, that he would leave town. And the rabbi said to him, do you know why a horse, before it drinks out of a pond or pool, a lake, first puts its hoof into the water and then drinks? The man said no. The rabbi said because the horse, when he looks into the water, sees another horse. And he puts his hoof in to chase that horse away because he's afraid there's not enough water for him. And he said, what I suggest you do is just the opposite and pray for this man to be successful. And he took the rabbi's advice and both of them became very successful businessmen. When a person is jealous financially of someone else, it really shows a lack of faith in God. Because one has to know that whatever God gives you is custom made for you, for your benefit. And much like doctors, you know, there was a, uh, a man who was in a semi-private room. And the doctor came in and looked at his chart and told the nurse that he should be on a very restricted diet, no salt, no sugar, uh, low fats, very bland. The man liked to eat. And when he heard this, he was very distraught. And then the doctor went to the patient next to him and looked at his chart and said, this person can have anything he wants and makes no difference. Milkshakes, pie, cake, anything. And when the man heard this, he became very irate. And he said to the doctor, he said, he's dying. Why would you give him all this good stuff and me? You make me suffer? The doctor said, exactly because this will kill you. He's already dying, so he can have whatever he wants. But for you, it's a problem. And so too with God and what we have. God decides what's best for us, though we may not agree. Now, it's interesting that this jealousy, uh, we see it in the Torah in a very interesting way. The Torah deals with a concept called the Sota, a woman who is accused of her husband of infidelity. And he has told her not to seclude, seclude herself with a certain man, Witnesses see that she does. And the Torah allows for her. It was during the temple times. In fact, this ritual was done until 40 years before the end of the second temple. The ritual allows for the man to take his wife to the temple. And there she is cross-examined um, by, by the priest and asked whether she had relations with the man or not. And if she says she didn't. And the priest will then say to her that she has to drink from the water of the Sota, which consisted of water, dirt from the floor, ashes from the, you know, dust from the floor. And they would write on parchment the name of God and put that parchment into the water, erasing God's name. Now the third commandment of the Ten Commandments tells us not to use God's name in vain and also not to erase God's name. And yet for this ritual, to, alleviate, to eliminate this, this uh, jealousy that her husband has, God allows his name to be erased. Now, if she's found guilty, then this water will give her a very uh, horrendous death, not only her, but also to her lover. And if she is innocent, the husband has to be there. He can't send a messenger. He has to see this procedure going on. And if she is innocent then God will bless her with a son within the year. Which is very strange. So God allows his name to be erased and she's punished right away if she's guilty. And if she's innocent, even though she secluded herself with a man, God will give her a child. Because the Torah realizes, and God, again, the author of the Torah, how grievous is this, is this trait of jealousy. And the only way to eliminate it, God will give a child to reconcile the family, that they'll have a beautiful child, so that they'll come together and this feeling of jealousy will hopefully leave. Because it destroys everything. And God 
wants to be a partner in goodness, not in evil. But there's nothing like this. There's nothing in Torah where someone's punished right away or given a reward. Even though the truth of the matter is, she's not totally innocent. She did seclude herself with a man, which she shouldn't have done. But still, to keep the family together, to eliminate this trait of jealousy. Now, what's interesting is in the Tenth Commandment, which we talked about the last time, which talks about not coveting, it uses the word covet three times, but then it also uses the word desire. Desire really connects to jealousy. And so what's the difference between coveting and desiring something? If someone has a house and you are jealous of the fact that he has that house and you want a house like his, that's desire, that's jealousy. But if you want his house, that's coveting. And what's interesting is if coveting means that if you go to him, let's say this man who has this house you want, works for you. And you go to him and you say, I want to buy your house. And he says, I like where I live. I really don't want to sell it. But you say to him, if you want to keep your job, you're going to have to sell me the house. And even if you pay him more than it's worth, you're covening his house. And it's a sin by the Torah, even though you pay him for it. On the other hand, jealousy is in the heart. Desire. And even though you haven't done an action, it's still considered a prohibition. And you can even be jealous of something you haven't seen. Just by hearing if someone has something and you want it. You want to have what he has. You want to be that wealthy because you're jealous of what he has. That is considered to be, again, to of uh, prohibition with the Tenth Commandment of one should not covet and one should not desire. Now, what's interesting is the, this desire of coveting is so horrendous that it can even wipe out all the benefits, all the good deeds that a person has. They tell a story of Ramosha of Susuv. Ramosha of Susuv was a great tzaddik, a very righteous individual. And he would travel from town to town, and he would meet with people when he would go there. And they would come to him and ask for blessings. And it was customary with a great rabbi that when someone would come for a blessing and ask the rabbi to bless them, that they would give what was called a pidgin. They would write a kvittel, a note, stating what they needed. And then they would give a donation. And the donation was really the vehicle, so to speak, giving charity, which took their request to God so that would be answered. When he came to this one town, a very wealthy woman that was there came to see Rav Moshe of Sasu. And with, great, with tears, she was very distraught. And she told him that her daughter, her only daughter, was on death's door, and the rabbis, pardon me, and the doctors had given up hope, and she needed a blessing. And she took a bag, a sack with, with coins in it, and put it on the desk for him to take. And he said, I don't want your money. Confused. He said, what I do want, though, is you have a silver menorah. I want you to give me the silver menorah in lieu of that money. And she said, it was really an heirloom. She had it from her grandfather. And he said, that's what I want. And he said, but I, not only do I want that menorah, I want you to give it to me willingly with an open heart, and then I'll give you a blessing. She said, if that's what you want, then that's what I'll do. She went home, took that silver candelabra, menorah that would be used for Hanukkah, and gave it to her Moshe Leib, and he blessed her that her child, that her child, that her daughter, should have a complete recovery. And sure enough, her daughter recovered. But everyone was quite confused, because it just so happened that Rav Moshe Leib of Sosov had his own menorah that had been given to him by his rabbi, Mishmelka of Nicholsburg, that he cherished. And every year, he would light it in front of the whole congregation. And they were surprised as to why he would want this one. And came Hanukkah. And both menorahs were up at the front of the, of the, of the synagogue. And the Hasidim, his, the congregants, were wondering which one he would light. And as he always had, he lit his special menorah that he got from Shmelkov Nicholsburg. 
And then he called out his Yechiel Tsuraf here. And Yechiel Tsuraf was a silversmith. And uh, he asked him to come to the front and stand next to him. And he was greatly honored. But he was really a very simple person. And he was quite confused as to why the Rebbe would want him to come to the front. And as they were standing there, he said, let me tell you a story. You see, your father, your great-grandfather, your great-grandfather, your grandfather, whose name you have, was also Rabbi Yechiel Tzara, was a righteous individual, not very wealthy, and he also was a silversmith. And when it came time for him to marry off his daughter, he had no money, and he went from place to place trying to gather the funds to be able to marry off his daughter. And he was told that there was a rich man who did give money for weddings. So he went to the man. And when this rich man found out who he was, he saw him. He says, you're a Bechil Tzaref, right? He's correct. The silversmith, right? So it just so happened that your grandfather had a menorah, a silver menorah, that he was, a, he was a Talmud of Reb Zusha of Anapoli. And every year, Reb Zusha would give his Hasidim a silver coin. And he saved all these coins and melted them down and made this menorah with those coins. And the rich man said to your grandfather, I will give you 10,000 golden coins, not as a loan, because he won't be able to pay me back anyways, but as a gift in exchange for that menorah that you have. Because I know you have that menorah that you made out of Zusha's coins. And your grandfather was taken back. He really didn't want to give this up. It was a very precious thing for him. And what he did was, begrudgingly, he gave it to him. The problem was, even though this man was very righteous and had done many good deeds when he got to heaven, this stood in his way. And that's why I want to give you back this menorah that you, from your grandfather so that his soul can now be allowed to go into heaven. So we see that covening is so evil that even though the man was a righteous individual and had many good deeds to his credit, this blocked his entrance. So a person needs to know that a person needs to be careful not to covet. And even the idea of there were two men that lived across from each other, one a Talmud Chacham, and one a simple man. And, they, and the simple man looked at the, at the, at the Talmud Chacham and sighed. And we saw that we both get up in the morning and do what we have to do. And look, he has so much merit. He goes and learns. I just go through a mundane life. And it broke his heart. And the righteous individual looked at this simple worker and, and had contempt for him and what he did. And what's interesting is when they got to heaven... The righteous individual, because of his contempt, was held back. And because of the sigh that the simple man let out, of his jealousy of the fact that he couldn't have the life that the righteous man supposedly had, he was given a high place in heaven. And that becomes the key. That's, you can be jealous of a person's good deeds, of a person's Torah, of a person's high aspirations, but you can't be jealous of his material goods. And those things that are really unimportant. And that should make you strive to be better. So we need to use that trait of jealousy in a positive way. And God forbid not in an evil way. To make us grow. To become better people. And to always push harder. To serve God in a better way. Thank you for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos.